One second, just give me a minute. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And welcome all to today's talk on Gandhi and mass media. So before we begin the program, let me introduce a speaker of the day, Dr. Teresa Joseph. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I pronounce her name correctly. And uh, Dr. Teresa Joseph is currently associate professor in the Department of Political Science of Alfonso College, Pala, Kerala. She is also the director of UGC sponsored Center for Gandhian Studies of the college. She did a postgraduate MPhil and research programs in the School of International Relations and Politics in Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotayam. Her areas of specialization include international relations, media and politics and Gandhian studies. She was selected by the United States Department of State for in its International Visitor Leadership Program on developing American studies curricula in 2011. She has a number of publications to her credit, including four books. She's the author of Reporting Nuclear Pakistan, Security Perception and Indian Press. She has also co-edited two books, Deliberative Democracy, Understanding the Indian Experience and Conflict Resolution in South Asia. She has written articles in several national and international journals, including Contemporary South Asia, Gandhi Mar, India Quarterly, India Journal of Politics and International Relations, South Asian Journal of Diplomacy, Indian Journal of Political Science, Journal of Parliamentary Studies, Mainstream and Social Action, quite impressive. Her recent book is on Mahatma Gandhi and mass media, mediating conflict and social change. It is published by Rutledge. The book Mahatma Gandhi and Mass Media explores Gandhi's engagement with print media. It examines how Gandhi, the man and his message, negotiated the socio-political circumstances of his milieu and the modes of communication that he adopted towards this end. It analyzes the role that he played in building up alternative modes of communication in South Africa and India. The volume elucidates his interactions with colonial communication order and his contestations of the same through various methods that included setting up new journals and newspapers and taking on roles of writer, journalist, editor, and publisher. It unveils Gandhiji's engagement with mass media and print journalism, particularly concerning issues of conflict and conflict resolution, as well as social transformation right from his days in London to the last days of his life. It's a very interesting topic. And uh, we have, uh, you know, the role of Gandhiji. So that way, at least when some of my students have joined, I'm really hoping that students gain by that and we also will gain by that. So fresh insights are always welcome. And uh, we are really looking forward to uh, Dr. Teresa Joseph actually enlightening us with the talk. Over to you, Dr. Teresa. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Usha Vijayalakshmi, for the very generous and uh, warm words of welcome. I uh, thank Mumbai Research Center of the uh, Asiatic Society of Mumbai for inviting me to this program and uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about my book. So, uh, so uh, actually, uh, to start off with, it's uh, actually quite interesting that uh, at a time when the internet did not exist, nor did the mass media as we know of it today, Gandhi was able to attract international attention. And his worldwide appeal was possible, not only because of the issues that he raised and pursued or the message that he sought to convey, but also because of the manner in which he conveyed it. Gandhi used various means of uh, various media of mass communication to convey his message. And uh, as all of us are well aware, uh, we are all well aware of his, uh, the symbols that he used and uh, uh, 
to just intervene. I'm really happy to have some students also uh, here. It makes me a little more comfortable uh, uh, because I think the older scholars may be quite aware of uh, much of what I'm saying, but anyway. So Gandhi used very uh, various medias of uh, media of mass communication to convey his message. And uh, we know the symbols that he used, including his clothing, Kadi, the spinning wheel, salt, uh, his physicality, walking, language, the fast silences, uh, spinning wheel, prayer meetings, and so on. Not only his symbols, but also his uh, oratorical practices and his writing expertise. So uh, all these enabled him to communicate his message to the world. And uh, his prolific writing is uh, particularly evident from the 100 volumes of the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi published by the government of India uh, for the benefit of the students. It's a collection of about 98 volumes. Uh, uh, there are scholars who say that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of material which is still not included in the uh, 98 volumes. And uh, so this is a collection of his writings, his, uh, 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 his speeches, his letters, and uh, all his communication. So we have a huge uh, collection out there. And uh, so, but despite the fact that he was a writer, an editor, a publisher, and despite the tremendous documentary evidence that he has left us with, uh, not much work has been done in this regard in the context of uh, how he engaged with the mass media or particularly with the print media, which of course was the dominant mode of communication at that point of time. So uh, I feel that actually the biggest legacy that uh, Gandhi left us is with is that he has provided us with uh, lessons for the future, lessons that we can draw upon in different walks of life and uh, including journalism. So uh, coming to my... <laughs> Coming to my book, uh, my book as uh, introduced hey, you. Uh, as introduced, uh, my book uh, discusses how Gandhi engaged with the socio-political milieu of his yeah. life, particularly. Shit! Fucking, fucking hell! Okay. So, uh, sorry about this, ma'am. I'm sorry. No I have removed uh, the person who was trying to create some mischief. Okay. So, yeah, no problem. There is someone who has. Uh, entered with the name B. Please rename yourself, otherwise we'll remove you. Someone who has entered with the name B. Uh, just all those who do not have a full name, please rename yourself immediately or we will remove you. If you don't want any disturbance, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Gabriel Garson has got some question. He has raised his hand. Uh, yes, Mr. Garson. Gabriel Gibson, sorry. Um, I I can't hear because sounds um, keeps playing this music and it's getting annoying. Yeah, we have Did removed that person. Oh, thank you, thank you. Ma'am, please continue. Okay, sure. Okay, so um, uh. So actually talking about my book, uh, the title of the book is uh, Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Mass Media, Mediating Conflict and uh, Social Change. And uh, essentially it discusses how uh, Gandhi engaged with the socio-political milieu of his time and particularly with regard to conflict and social change and uh, through the print media. So, uh, so the narrative of my book is essentially organized around specific events in the history of the Indian community in South Africa towards the end of the 19th century and issues in India in the beginning first half of the 20th century. Uh, of course, uh, we know that the media are linked to the socio-cultural, political, economic, historical, and technological circumstances of the time in which they are situated, and we need to view them as such. So uh, 
the existing colonial communication strategies, its contestations, the socio-political circumstances of the time, as well as Gandhi's own message of truth, nonviolence, and conflict transformation. All these provide the contextual background to understanding Gandhi's own communication strategies and his engagement with the mass media. So uh, history has uh, revealed how empires have sought to control not only territories, but also the minds of the people in order to sustain themselves and grow. And this was clearly reflected in colonial communication strategies. New communication te uh, technologies were often acquired by the state and utilized to oppress the population and gaining access to communication technology enabled people to oppose the power of the state more effectively. So colonial communication strategies and contestations of the same were a reflection of these tendencies. So coming to the specific context, by the early 19th century, Britain had become a major communication media power as well as a predominant imperial power. Its capacity to disseminate news, information and ideas around the world was unparalleled. So colonial power and media power sustained and reinforced each other. So while on the one hand, the empire attempted to control the press through various methods, both overt as well as covert, on the other hand, building up alternative modes of communication became an essential part of the struggle against media power, struggle against imperial power rather. So it was in this particular point of history that Mahatma Gandhi entered the world of mass communication. Now, Gandhi's entry into journalism uh, or mass media came uh, as a result of his encounter with the British vegetarian movement. It was during his days, his student days in London, when he uh, came across the vegetarian society and we know he became a member of the society. And he wrote a series of articles in the vegetarian. This was in 1891. And these articles discussed the food and festivals of India within the larger social context and particularly how vegetarianism and non-vegetarianism are related to questions or link, interlinked with questions of religion and caste. So basically, these articles sought to, uh, sought to remove, to uh, address the preconceived or the prevailing preconceived notions of Indian society. So if you go through the articles, actually what strikes us is that uh, the point is that Gandhi was only 21 years of age at that time. But his sharp powers of observation and the regard for facts are, are very evident in these articles which he wrote at that very young age. Now, uh, during his stay in England, he had not uh, really experienced much open racism. But uh, we know that uh, once he reached South Africa from London, of course, he came back to India and he moved on to South Africa in 1893. And uh, once he reached South Africa, he came face to face with various kinds of racial discrimination. So the very day after his arrival, uh, Gandhi wore his uh, head dress uh, to the magistrate's court. Uh, this was in Durban. And the magistrate asked him to remove uh, the headdress because he took it as a sign of disrespect. So uh, Gandhi refused to uh, remove the headgear and in, instead he walked out of the courtroom. Now this caught the attention of the media and it was critically reported by the Natal Advertiser, a leading newspaper at that time, and uh, in an article titled An Unwelcome Visitor. Of course, the unwelcome visitor was Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, the article was critical of this unwelcome visitor who walked out of the courtroom rather than removing the headgear as suggested by the uh, magistrate. Uh, so reading this report, Gandhi immediately uh, responded. He wrote a letter to the editor pointing out that uh, just as it, as it is a mark of respect uh, among Europeans to remove their hats, uh, similarly, it was uh, um, uh, on, in the Indian community, uh, people kept their, retained their headdress to show their respect. And uh, the paper published his letter, and this was on the fourth day after Gandhi's arrival in South Africa. And this issue was widely discussed. Now, this marked the beginning of a series of letters that Gandhi started writing to counter white sentiment, the misconceptions or misrepresentations of the Indian community. So uh, particularly about the Indian community being unhygienic, dirty, 
and responsible for spreading diseases, uh, being illiterate, and so on. So uh, just to give a, uh, one example, a lead report in the Natal Advertiser spoke of, to quote, wily, rich, wretched Asian traders who were parasites living a semi-barbaric life. Gandhi responded with the query whether, in his uh, response to the paper, he, he asked whether the fact that they led a simple life without carpets, without expensive furniture, or without tablecloths reflected a lack of civilization. Again, in, uh, so uh, uh, like that, we have a whole lot of letters uh, to the press that Gandhi writes during this period. And uh, in 1894, we know of his open letter to both houses of the Natal legislature, where he quotes extensively from the South African press, uh, extensively quoting such derogatory remarks in the uh, African, South African newspapers. But at the same time, his own writings remained very polite. His own writings were very restrained. And uh, uh, these were well, actually well received by the press. So uh, Gandhi made extensive use of newspapers. He started writing articles. He started giving interviews to the press. And these are all focused on the grievances uh, about the treatment of the Indian community, the hardships they, that they faced, uh, and so on. He also started making use of the cable and telegraph. And he wrote regularly in, lo in local newspapers, particularly the Natal Mercury, the Johannesburg Star. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, it is quite surprising that uh, these South African newspapers, mostly, I uh, forgot to mention, mostly white owned newspapers, of course. It is surprising that they published uh, so many of Gandhi's letters and articles, but uh, probably because of his style of writing, his tone of writing, his restraint. And uh, probably they consider, consider, considered his arguments to be valid or uh, so on. So, uh, of course, at the same time, while they published, they did continue to publish reports ridiculing the Indians, but they also uh, published uh, Gandhi's responses to these articles. And uh, so, uh, uh, after a point of time, he was able to generate an interest even in international publications such, such as the Times of London and the New York Times, the British-owned newspapers back in India, and uh, uh, such as the Times of India and the Statesman. Uh, he also became the Durban, Johannesburg, and South African correspondent of uh, Dadabai Nauroji's journal, India. And uh, uh, so in all these, he wrote extensively about the grievances of Indians. So uh, he also wrote about the Indian Franchise Bill, uh, we know, which sought to take away the rights of Indians to elect members to the, uh, the NATO Legislative Assembly. So in 1896, uh, he wrote the grievances of the British Indians in South Africa and appealed to the Indian public. This he wrote when he was back in India on a visit. And as we know, this was known as the green pamphlet because of the cover of the pamphlet. Now, uh, this is a, a booklet or pamphlet which uh, consisted of 50 pages. But of these 50 pages, 26 pages actually quoted extensively from South African newspapers. And these were sent to all major newspapers in India, and they did have a major impact in bringing the attention of the people of India to the problems, to the grievances of the Indians in South Africa. But uh, uh, coming back to South Africa, uh, Gandhi began to realize that he could not rely on the goodwill of the uh, white press. So, and he felt that uh, there was an urgent need for a newspaper for the community. So uh, in fact, the Indian community had actually felt the long need for a newspaper of their own. They tried various initiatives, various efforts were taken, but unfortunately, largely because of lack of funds, uh, the news it didn't uh, uh, take off. In 1898, Madanjit Vyavaharik, uh, that is, he was an active member of the Natal Indian Congress. Uh, he established the uh, international printing press and he established this with the help of Gandhi. He sought Gandhi's uh, uh, advice and assistance. And Gandhi, in fact, played a major role in the inauguration of the press. And uh, uh, so the international printing press started. And soon after, Vyavaharik proposed starting a newspaper, a newspaper in four languages, English, Hindi, Gujarati, Tamil. And uh, so... Uh, Gandhi uh, agreed to support it with his writings and if necessary, with, uh, financially. Ultimately, he did uh, contribute financially as well as uh, with his writing substantially. 
So, and thus was born Indian opinion. This was in 1903 in uh, South Africa. And Gandhi was never the editor of Indian opinion. The editor was actually, uh, the first editor was uh, Nasser. And uh, the subsequent editors, except for him, subsequently all the editors were actually uh, uh, Englishmen or belonging to the white community. But uh, although Gandhi was not officially the editor, he uh, initially bore all the expenses. He wrote much of the articles and he scrutinized all the material that uh, was to be published. And this marked the entry of uh, Gandhi into the field of journalism in a systematic way. In uh, the next year, 1904, Vyavaharik uh, gave the press, international printing press, as well as the newspaper Indian Opinion to uh, Gandhi to repay his loans and Vyavaharik wanted to return to India. So uh, Gandhi accepted the offer and uh, he shifted the international printing press to Phoenix Settlement. Uh, of course, we know that Phoenix Settlement in South Africa was established by Gandhi on the basis of, uh, uh, based on Ruskin's uh, ideals. But uh, uh, yeah, we will not go into that part of it. But anyway, the press was shifted into uh, uh, to Phoenix Settlement and the press and the newspaper. So Indian opinion, the basic objectives of Indian opinion as Gandhi expressed it, were basically to make the grievances of Indians in South Africa known to the government, to the whites in South Africa and in England, and to the people of India. That was the main objective, as well as to generate an awareness among the Indian community of their own shortcomings and to encourage them to overcome these shortcomings and to eliminate the distinctions between the Hindus and Muslims among the Gujaratis, Tamilians, and people from Bengal in South Africa. So essentially, Gandhi used Indian opinion not only to draw the attention of the authorities to the injustices, to the discrimination faced by the Indian community, but also to bring the people, the Indian community together. So, uh, and uh, Indian opinion was not only critical of the government, but also of the shortcomings of the community itself. So uh, he tried to overcome uh, the social injustices. He reached out to the community to generate awareness, not only of their rights, but also of their responsibilities. He wrote extensively on sanitation, health, good citizenship, and so on. And uh, every, each and every case of uh, discrimination or any uh, kind of uh, oppression faced by the Indian community, he made an effort to bring it out in the uh, newspaper. So uh, Indian opinion gradually became Gandhi's weapon in the Satyagraha movement against the Asiatic Registration Act. Uh, uh, of course, we know the act made it compulsory for fingerprinting and body identification marks. And uh, so through Indian opinion, Gandhi uh, taught the people, the people of the Indian community, the philosophy of Satyagraha. In fact, the very name Satyagraha, uh, Gandhi asked the readers for uh, a suitable name. Uh, initially, he referred to it as civil resistance uh, and so on, but it did not... Uh, uh, really convey the meaning that he felt. And uh, he, he actually called for uh, suggestions as a competition. And uh, finally, that is how Sadagraha was suggested uh, and uh, Gandhi tweaked it to Satyagraha. So uh, Indian opinion kept the, uh, not only the Indian community informed about what is happening, but also the white community. Indian opinion was, uh, was an open newspaper. Everything was the whole Satyagraha movement was very open to the public. And uh, he felt the movement is based on truth and nonviolence. So there is no secrecy. There was no need for secrecy in it. So even the authorities made it a point to read the newspaper to find out what was happening. Gandhi's plans, his uh, logistics, everything was mentioned in Indian opinion. Now, uh, Indian opinion, of course, has faced uh, criticism for particularly for having excluded the plight of the black African uh, community and his tone of uh, condescension uh, of them. Uh, so, but uh, uh, as with regard to many aspects of uh, Gandhi's uh, thoughts and philosophy and his perspectives, we know that his perspectives have uh, witnessed a continuous uh, change. And we see that slow gradual change in his position with regard to this also. And this is very, becomes very clear when we go through his writings in Indian opinion. Uh, and uh, particularly with his, the way he used the word kafir and uh, later on to moving on to the more neutral Africans. And more importantly, Gandhi felt that 
uh, although the problems that both the Indian community and the Black African community faced were the same, the way to address it was different. And uh, of course, the um, um, even more importantly, the objectives of Indian opinion explicitly stated that it was to advocate the cause of uh, British Indians in uh, South Africa. But uh, so in any case, during his 21 years in South Africa, Gandhi certainly contributed much to alleviating the conditions of the Indian community and the print, India, print media, particularly Indian opinion, was uh, very much a part of this journey towards justice. Now, uh, we know Gandhi returned to India in 1915. And uh, his return to India, by then uh, he has had quite a good experience with the print media. And, uh, uh, and uh, coming to the case of India, uh, we see the emergence of uh, Indian-owned newspaper, Indian-owned newspapers. We see the emergence of the vernacular press and also, of course, movements for social, political, religious reform. We see a section of the press. Of course, the press was in different uh, uh, compartments. We see a section of the press becoming uh, vehicles of anti-colonial movements, anti-colonial dissent. And uh, uh, the press was contributing, of course, to the development and growth of nationalist feelings. So by the end of the 19th century, uh, the press, particularly people like, just to name a few, uh, Raja Ramohan Roy, Gangadhar Bhattacharya, James Silk, Silk Buckingham, Aurobindo Ghosh, Dadabai Nauroji, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, and of course, uh, Motilal Ghosh, Ishwar Chandra Vidyas, a host of uh, other people who were on the forefront of uh, using the press to advocate political independence and social reform. So by this point of time, the struggle for the freedom of the press was emerging very much as an integral part of the struggle for independence. So uh, Gandhi's emergence at the forefront of the national movement provided a major impetus for Indian journalism. He built on the foundations laid by his predecessors. And uh, essentially we find that after 1915, that uh, Indian journalism reflects a major influence of uh, Gandhi. So uh, now Gandhi felt that he has in, on different uh, occasions expressed the view that uh, the British were able to establish their rule in India because of the support extended to it by the people of India. So to quote him, the English have not taken India, we have given it to them. So uh, he essentially argued that the empire had to be fought not only at the political level, but also simultaneously at the socioeconomic, cultural, and attitudinal levels. So for this, what he felt was that mass awakening was the need of the earth. So uh, to quote him again, public opinion was a force mightier than that of gunpowder. Publicity is our best and perhaps the only weapon of defense. So. Uh, he felt that these were the prerequisites for the nonviolent struggle for independence. So it is based on this understanding that uh, uh, the struggle and philosophy of the Indian national movement and Gandhi's perspective lay. So, and uh, Gandhi's uh, engagement with the mass media, with journalism, needs to be viewed in this larger context. In fact, in 1935, he wrote in the Hindu, in our march towards our goal, I know that journalism will play a most important part in shaping the destinies of our country. So uh, as in South Africa, Gandhi began to use the print media to generate awareness and uh, mobilize people. So uh, in India, the causes that uh, Gandhi sought to uh, serve were, of course, uh, included social, economic, and uh, within the larger quest for Swaraj. But, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me. So, uh, but there was no question um, uh, of generating publicity for publicity's sake. He, he was not trying to sensationalize or, or attract public attention for the sake of publicity. This becomes particularly clear uh, uh, when we look at how we made use of the press in the initial years. Uh, he made a strategic use of the press actually, depending, he used the media according to the nature of the issue at hand. In some cases, such as the Keda Satyagraha, the Vaikyam Satyagraha, the SALT Satyagraha, non-cooperation movement, civil disobedience movement, Quit India movement, questions of communalism, 
untouchability, uh, protest against the Rawla attack. All these, for, in all these cases, he uh, asked for maximum, he called for maximum publicity. And uh, whereas in other cases, such as the Champaran Satyagraha or the Ahmadabad mill worker strike or discussions with viceroys, he preferred to be discreet. So this reflected the cautious use of the media. Of course, the Champaran <coughs> Satyagraha, he felt was a very sensitive uh, uh, issue and, uh, and he felt that the, the media would uh, uh, jeopardize the negotiations that were taking place. And the mill, work, mill worker strike, he felt that it was an issue between the, the owners and the workers and uh, the public need not uh, come into it because it would uh, uh, may again jeopardize the case. So was the discussions with vice rice. So in fact, he was extremely critical of uh, the media conjectures. And uh, uh, he felt that this could be detrimental to the common good. And uh, uh, he informed his opponents directly or through his writings before any uh, conflict. So he always made it a point to address those on both sides of the conflict and only where necessary, he brought in the media or he wrote to the press. So uh, in fact, on several occasions, he, uh, as in the case of uh, uh, Keda Satyagraha, he wrote to the uh, media not to send the uh, reporters that he would uh, give them what is necessary, any information that is necessary. So Gandhi's writings actually re reflected a scrupulous regard for facts. He sought to again combat common misconceptions in the empire. And uh, of course, he sought to hasten Indian independence through nonviolent methods. And uh, he drafted press releases for journalists and news agencies. He sent cables to uh, expatriate Indians in the metropole. He also, uh, he made it a point, if you go through his writings uh, and his speeches, he, he's been uh, called on to inaugurate numerous functions and so on. Uh, even among the newspaper inauguration, inaugurating new new newspapers, speaking among uh, pub, uh, the press uh, gatherings, where he reprimands editors for misreporting. So, uh, with the passing of the Indian Press Act in 1919, this curbed the freedom of the press to publish articles that were critical of the government. Of course, this was also there earlier, but as a result of this, several proprietors of newspapers were prosecuted and were forced to stop publication. Gandhi retaliated to this by issuing an unregistered newspaper named Satyagrahi. So the first issue of Satyagrahi, he, uh, he writes, uh, he, he, uh, the first issue appears with a prayer to read, copy, and circulate. This was an, an unregistered newspaper. And uh, uh, newspapers like the Bombay Chronicle, which supported the freedom movement, uh, reproduced it as such. And uh, the editor of the Bombay Chronicle, uh, B.G. Horniman, in 1919, he was uh, deported by the authorities uh, because uh, of the position he took. And uh, uh, at this point of time, the owners of the Bombay Chronicle asked uh, Gandhi to take over the paper as editor. Uh, but at that point of time, the government banned the Bombay Chronicle also. So uh, the, own, the people who owned the Bombay Chronicle also owned Young India and asked him to take over the own, uh, editorship of Young India. And uh, so also the uh, uh, editors of the owners of Navajeevan Ane Satya, which was a monthly, they also asked him to take over as editor. Now, uh, same as happened in uh, South Africa, he now got his own instruments of, to express his views, to convey his message to the people. He uh, with a lot of uh, 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 doubts and uh, fear, as, ex as he writes in his autobiography and in his writings, he took over, but he took over both uh, editorship of both Young India and Navajeevan. Now, Young India was, uh, Young India was in English, catering to the all an All India readership, and Navajeevan, uh, Navajeevan Ane Satya was uh, renamed as Navajeevan, and it targeted the uh, Gujarati, it was in Gujarati and targeted the Gujarati community, of course. So the aims of Navajeevan, uh, I'd just like to quote that, uh, were to see that the animosity between the ruler and the ruled is replaced by friendship and the distrust between them by trust. That there is unity of heart between Hindus and Muslims, that India achieves economic freedom, 
and that all over the country there is nothing but love. Navajeevan will never hesitate to say what needs to be said for fear of forfeiting security or exposing its staff to personal risks. But in telling the truth, it will not depart from courtesy. So, and that is something that we see in uh, uh, all his, uh, uh, in uh, Navajivian and Young India throughout the years. Uh, he did not hesitate to say, uh, to call a spade a spade, but whatever he said was said with courtesy. And uh, we know that in 1922, uh, Gandhi was arrested on charges of sedition. Sedition for having written three articles in Young India. And uh, he was sentenced to six years imprisonment. Uh, uh, of course, due to medical reasons, he was uh, released after the two years. And of course, at the, the trial, we know of the great trial uh, at this point of time. And uh, in his absence, Young India and Navajeevan were uh, edited by people like C. Raja Obalachari, Jairam Dalatram, George Joseph, uh, C.F. Andrews, Mahadev Desai. Uh, of course, when we talk about Gandhi and uh, his writings and journalism and media, mass communication, Mahadev Desai is a very important name. Mahadev Desai was Gandhi's personal secretary from 1919 until 1942. And uh, uh, it is because of Desai that we have so much of uh, documentary evidence of Gandhi's speeches and the writings. It, he is someone who supported Gandhi very much in uh, helping him with his writings, even the writings in the newspapers that he uh, edited. So uh, through his journals, Gan uh, Gandhi sought to contest the colonial system and also generate awareness on social change. He sought to reach out to all sections of the people and to promote the cause of Satyagraha once again. So he wrote extensively on questions of communal harmony, the uh, rural development, education, untouchability, the status of women, health, hygiene, khadi, trusteeship, poverty, unemployment, peace, nonviolence, and so on. And of course, um, importantly, he sought to draw the attention of readers from cities to the villages. Of course, we know his basic perspective that India lives in its villages. So uh, Gandhi's writings were, in a sense, uh, contextualized responses to contemporary social, economic, and political issues within the larger framework of his faith in truth and nonviolence. So uh, coming to the uh, coming to 1930 or the particularly the Salt March. Before the Dandi March itself, Gandhi gave detailed reports of the, he wrote extensively on the implications of the salt tax. And he used the media, both national and international, extensively during the march. So it is uh, this point of time we see uh, at the international level also, we see made major coverage of uh, Gandhi and the freedom movement. We know, of course, about Webb Miller, Webb Miller, <coughs> sorry, uh, of the United Press, who covered the salt march and uh, uh, of course, it is his reporting, which is basically comes in the movie Gandhi. And, uh, uh, and of course, his statement, Gandhi's statement that I want world sympathy in this battle against, of uh, battle of right against might. So uh, with the Salt March, the Indian Press Ordinance of 1930 brought further censorship and securities were to be furnished. So uh, Gandhi declared that it was better to suspend newspapers and he suspended the publication of Navajeevan and Young India. But he continued to bring them out in cyclo-style form. And, uh, but uh, ultimately, both newspapers uh, were closed down in, 19, in 1932 when uh, Gandhi was arrested. Uh, interestingly, uh, in 1933, while still in jail, Gandhi started the Harijan newspapers uh, with the financial assistance of G.D. Birla, who was a close associate and the founding president of the Harijan Sevak Sangh. So, of course, uh, we know the Harijan focused on the Harijan newspapers were three newspapers. Uh, Harijan was in English, Harijan Sevak in Hindi and Harijan Bandhu in Gujarati. Now, uh, the Harijan newspapers, uh, of course, focused on the cause of the backward communities in India. And uh, even though he was in uh, prison, uh, the British were also happy to uh, happy to see that he was turning to such an issue because they felt safer with him addressing issues of uh, untouchability and the backward community rather than political causes. So um, 
so to that extent through hydrogen and of course his later his his uh, uh, tours around the country he was able to bring through various methods he was able to bring the question of unt untouchability to the attention to a larger uh, attention uh, and as bring it as part of the indian national movement uh, in 1940 we see that with the government notice that uh, no account of uh, vinoba bhave's arrest should be reported in hydrogen Gandhi suspended all the Harijan newspapers and he even refunded all the subscriptions. Again, the newspapers were resumed in 1942, and, uh, but the Harijan newspapers kept being intermittently suspended and uh, uh, to continue. Uh, whenever there was any kind of pressure by the government to, uh, to provide security or about censorship or to uh, avoid reporting on anything, Gandhi preferred to suspend his newspapers. And then he would start them, uh, restart them when the uh, situation changed. So uh, while the Harijan newspapers focused on the backward communities, Young India and Navajivan were Gandhi's weapons to contest the colonial system and build a new India. Uh, so, uh, and Satyagrahi, the unregistered newspaper of 1919 was, uh, published with the specific intention of defying the Rowlatt bill uh, and of course thereby the British government. So, uh, so clearly Gandhi used the press not only to contest British colonialism, but also to promote the regeneration of Indian society. So uh, what I have done here is I have basically just uh, uh, provided a very brief bird's eye view of uh, a historical account of uh, Gandhi's trust with journalism. Uh, from his days in London, uh, his articles in the in uh, the Vegetarian, to South Africa, the International Printing Press, the Indian Opinion, to his uh, back in India, Satyagrahi, Young India, Navajivan, and uh, Harrison newspapers. So uh, when we go through these uh, uh, this historical overview, when we go through his newspapers and so on, we can actually find. Uh, uh, certain common trends uh, running through Gandhi's engagement with the press over the years. And uh, uh, I think these trends uh, of uh, some of the points that we can pick out hold probably hold lessons for the contemporary world of journalism. <laughs> now, uh, journalism for Gandhi was a mission rather than a profession. In fact, he, in, he wrote in Young India in 1925 that he had taken up journalism to quote, not for its sake, but merely as an aid to what I have conceived to be my mission in life. It was a means to serve the public. Again, in his autobiography, Gandhi writes, and I'd like to quote, there are certain spheres of work which are of such consequence and have such a bearing on public welfare that to undertake them merely for earning one's livelihood will defeat the primary aim behind them. Newspapers are meant primarily to educate the people. They make the latter familiar with contemporary history. This is a work of no mean responsibility. And this is the way in which Gandhi tried to engage with the media. So uh, the quest for truth and nonviolence were, of course, the underlying principles of Gandhi's life and philosophy. And this was clearly reflected in his uh, trust with journalism. Uh, he made it a point to verify all facts before publishing a report. Now, uh, and this is clearly evident even right from his days in the vegetarian, this consistent regard for truth and this, this urge to dispel uh, common misconceptions, to, uh, to counter Western narratives and to fight misrepresentations. Now, Gandhi himself pointed out, uh, again to quote, it is a fact that readers cannot always trust newspapers Often, facts are found to be quite the opposite of what has been reported. If newspapers realized that it was their duty to educate the people, they could not but wait to check a report before publishing it. It is true that often they have to work under difficult conditions. They have to sift the true from the false in but a short time and can only guess at the truth. Even then, I am of the opinion that it is better not to publish a report at all if it has not been found possible to verify it. So uh, I found that a very important and very relevant quotation. 
Uh, he also adds, too often in our journals, as in others, do we get fiction instead of fact? So he always advised journalists, his own um, uh, reporters, his own people in his own newspapers, as well as other editors and journalists, to write only what can be substantiated. Substantiated. Uh, his uh, uh, advice to a young editorial member of the editorial staff of Young India was, to be accurate, original, and strong, you must become a student, go in for depth, walk around your subject, walk into it, walk through it. Now, uh, in fact, when we go back to the Keda Satyagraha, uh, uh, the editor of a newspaper had written critically of the Satyagraha. Now, Gandhi wrote to him and uh, uh, he found that the editor had not, uh, editor or no one in his paper had visited the area. And Gandhi very uh, expressly pointed out that uh, if you cannot visit, if you cannot take the time off to visit the area and, and find out the facts for yourself, please don't write about it. You have no right to write about it. So, um, of course, in keeping with his views of uh, that the success of nonviolent methods depended on enlightened public opinion, his newspapers, we find a lot of discussions on nonviolence. And uh, he wrote extensively on nonviolent resistance and the duties and responsibilities of Satyagrahis. And he also advised other editors also to focus, to talk about um, uh, nonviolence and also not to use violent language, not to use provocative language in their newspapers. Now, uh, Gandhi considered most conflicts to be structural in nature, having an impact on society as a whole. So it was necessary to educate the public on the social implications of unjust structures. And he felt that, uh, we need to ensure the, the participation of the larger community in the processes of resolving conflicts. So he sought to educate the victims as well as the perpetrators of injustice. So uh, he uh, sometimes felt that even the victims may not be aware of the system, the structures of injustice in society. So, uh, so the underlying principle of Gandhi's engagement with an opponent in a conflict was to keep the channels of communication open, to avoid intimidation, to remove all obstacles to dialogue. And Gandhi used journalism to reach out to opponents, to build bridges between adversaries. So uh, as an instrument of Satyagraha, uh, the press emphasized the path towards peace, Gandhi's press emphasize the path towards peace and, all the, uh, and the alternative to conflict and violence. So uh, the press became an essential part of Satyagraha philosophy of keeping the adversary informed of one's actions. He did justice to the perspective of the opponent. Uh, he made it a point to publish all perspectives in his paper, devoid of any confrontation. So he advocated, in fact, stepping into the shoes of the adversary to find out not only points of difference, but also points of uh, agreement. So Gandhi was extremely critical of newspapers that fanned the flames of communalism or inflamed passions or reported or assorted to misperceptions. So according to him, it was the duty of a journalist to promote friendship and to scrutinize anything or everything that may be written against any particular community. So uh, when we go through Gandhi's uh, writings, another aspect that strikes us is his language, not just its simplicity. Of course, we know that Gandhi used very simple language. It's very easy to read his writing, but uh, also the self-restraint and uh, as he himself says, sober reasoning. So. Uh, uh, so it, uh, not only the choice of topics, but also his language and the way he approached them. This is also of particular significance. His language was, was always measured, restrained. He was always willing to hear the other side. And uh, uh, he was able to communicate in a language that was accessible to all. And of course, we know that is probably one thing that contributed to his mass appeal. So his writings were free of any kind of bitterness, or any kind of exaggeration. He, his writings were often short, precise articles based on facts. Of course, on occasion, we do find long articles, we do find very long articles in fact, but essentially brief factual articles. And he felt that exaggeration was an impediment in the search for truth. Uh, he often expressed his, uh, his uh, uh, disappointment that some newspapers only served to spread 
misunderstanding through exaggeration and distortion. He implored that the language of anger and hatred should be avoided. And uh, to quote him, uh, very often in journals, we find declamation instead of sober reasoning. Uh, to quote him again, uh, he called upon journalists to curb your pen and tongue. Exercise the strictest economy of words, but not of truth. So he often reiterated whatever needs to be said. Uh, he often reiterated that whatever needs to be said should be done so openly, but with politeness and sober reasoning. So uh, at a public meeting in, uh, uh, organized by the Indian Press Association, this was against the Indian Press Act of 1910, Gandhi stated, to quote again, we must not forget that we have to do that, uh, resist the act, we have to do that under certain restrictions born of politeness and sobriety. So uh, in fact, Gandhi's advice to Manilal Gandhi, Manilal Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's son, who took over uh, Indian opinion after Gandhi left South Africa. Uh, I'd like to quote his advice. Uh, what Gandhi told Manilal Gandhi was, you should write what is truth in Indian opinion, but do not be impolite and do not give way to anger. Be moderate in your language. If you err, do not hesitate to confess it. So if you've made a mistake, don't hesitate to confess it. Speak the truth, but politely. So uh, another thing that uh, agitated uh, Gandhi was the conjectures of the press, particularly at critical moments. And this was particularly uh, towards the end when the uh, discussions with the viceroys, the uh, discussions about uh, partition and uh, independence and so on. He felt that uh, uh, correspondents and news agencies, instead of making the, uh, quoting him again, instead of making the publication of news a matter merely of making money, should think of the public good. So in fact, in uh, 1946, uh, this was of course context of uh, independence partition, and of course communalism, particularly in the context of the communal violence that was taking place. Gandhi referred to the newspaper man as a walking plague, walking plague. So, uh, and he also said at that same point of time, he also talks about that if he was appointed as a dictator for one day, he would stop all newspapers. There is actually something very surprising, very stunning coming from a person who right from the age of 21 has been involved with the media, uh, has been very much a part of the uh, press, but that is how uh, despondent he felt with the way other press was responding to situations at the time. So um, he wrote to editors, he used to write to editors of other newspapers also, to take special care in selection of news, not to put a single fact which could not be substantiated, not to indulge in criticism that could excite hatred. He also advised them not to use violent or provocative language to be restrained in their language. So those who worked with uh, Gandhi in his newspapers, they um, write that they have learned precision, purity of language, openness to the opponent, and the ability to express ideas in firm but polite language. In fact, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, of course, we know of her a uh, freedom fighter, member of the Constituent Assembly, uh, women's rights activist, and so on. Uh, she had been associated with the Harijan for many years. And she writes, Gandhi's high standards of journalism were his incomparable contribution to public life. So uh, again, uh, throughout the years, Gandhi had experienced various forms of censorship. And he was an uh, outspoken advocate of press freedom. And he strongly defended editors who were harassed by the government. So according to him, freedom of spe speech and pen is the foundation of Swaraj. If the foundation stone is in danger, you have to exert the whole of your might in order to defend that single stone. So uh, he was able to show by example, how to resist the empire's attempts at regulating, regulating the press. Of course, we know he quoted arrest. Uh, he suspended his newspapers. He brought out um, and the unregistered newspaper. He refused to accept any restrictions on his papers. And he, he specifically made it clear that he would rather close them down than submit to the government's interference. Uh, in the liberty of the press. Uh, and he, this is what he, he called of other editors also, to speak without fear and to uh, act on their conscience. But at the same time, he did not oppose any kind of, uh, he did not oppose some kind of internal check 
from within the community. This he was talking about some kind of journalist uh, association, some kind of uh, a journalistic body to uh, maintain check on the media if it was felt uh, necessary. So uh, what he felt was the newspaper press is a great power, but just as an unchained torrent of water submerges whole countrysides and devastates crops, even so an uncontrolled pen serves but to destroy. If the control is from without, it proves more poisonous than want of control. It can be profitable only when exercised from within. Strongly against external control, but control could be exercised from within. And he also felt that in order to abuse, address any abuse of freedom of by the press, to quote, the real remedy is healthy public opinion that will refuse to patronize poisonous journals. So uh, he also felt that the freedom of the press was a precious privilege to quote him, not only of journalists, but also of readers. So in fact, he felt that readers were in fact much more important than the proprietors themselves or the publisher. And uh, so he felt that they had the same responsibility as the publisher or the editor. So he devoted a lot of space in his newspapers, whether it was Indian opinion or the newspapers in India to, uh, to printing, to publishing uh, letters from and uh, from his readers, particularly letters that were critical. So uh, the critical letters outnumbered the letters which were in praise or admiration. We can see the, we know the, uh, the, uh, the debates with uh, Rabindranath Tagore on during the non-cooperation about students leaving schools. Gandhi published both sides. He left it to readers to decide. So uh, what he felt the aim was, his aim was not to silence critics, to silence criticism or to silence critics, but to remove misunderstandings. And after a point of time, he started responding, letters which were written to him personally also, he started responding publicly in his, through his newspapers. In fact, Jamnilal Bajaj once complained that Gandhi gave more space to his, complaint to Gandhi, that he gave more space to his critics than his admirers or adherents. And Gandhi's response was that he did not have to convert the converted. He preferred to listen to his critics. Uh, he preferred to learn from his critics. Now, uh, as a publisher, Gandhi involved himself in all levels of work relating to publishing. Uh, he was not only concerned with good writing, the content, but also the timely dispatch. He maintained perfect accounts. Uh, he considered poor printing to be an act of ahimsa or violence. And uh, to quote him again, he was extremely critical uh, uh, he saw newspapers as a means of service and he was critical of newspapers uh, you, of being used as profit making for profit making. So he argued when a newspaper is treated as a means of making profit, the result is likely to be serious malpractices. So he did not want anyone, particularly those who could afford to advertise themselves through newspapers to influence his quest for truth or exploit his newspapers for profit. So uh, except for Indian opinion in the initial stages, none of his newspapers accepted uh, advertisements. They did not solicit advertisements because he felt that the system of advertisement was bad in itself as uh, it lends to misrepresentation on a large scale. So, um, and uh, in 1925, uh, a reader of Navajivin actually raised a long critique and among, uh, amongst many things, he. Uh, talks about the cost of the newspaper and he says even though the international cost of newspaper of cost of paper was uh, decreasing the cost of Navajivan was not decreasing so uh, uh, he says the cost is high so Gandhi's response to quote I regard the subscribers as partners in Navajivan I insist on publishing it only as long as a certain minimum number of persons subscribe to it I also propose to meet its expenses through subscriptions alone and not through advertisements. Hence, its subscribers can, if they so desire, put an end to its publication. Those who subscribe to Navajivan are its owners and the profits earned by it are not private, but public income. So uh, it's, uh, we can see this is the same position taken in the case of question of copyright. He regarded copyright as a form, as a kind of pub, private property and uh, that prevented the free circulation of ideas. Uh, he, in his pamphlets, he specifically uh, printed no rights reserved. 
and uh, uh, in uh, hydrogen also he said there is no copyright in hydrogen and he says i know that there is a financial loss but as hydrogen is not published for profit i am content so long as there is no deficit i must believe that in the end my self denial must serve the cause of truth so uh, just to conclude gandhi's engagements with mass media uh, as well as contestations of the colonial communication order were clearly a reflection of his philosophy of life especially his philosophy his views on truth non violence conflict transformation so uh, we can see that he used his writings as a medium to generate awareness on so various social issues to highlight and protest against injustices and importantly to build uh, bridges to resolve or to transform conflict so gandhian journalism is uh, an ethics based journalism be it as a writer editor publisher or be it with regard to language style content the use of advertisements the quality of the finished product the cost of subscription or the responsibilities of a journalist so his writings were exercises in truth non violence and bridge building he believed that journalism was a means to serve the public a tool to protest against injustice and a medium to unite the people it was also a means to do justice to the perspective of the opponent that was devoid of confrontation so uh, in fact today's notions of peace journalism non violent journalism development journalism constructive journalism citizen journalism and so on uh, all of which reject the mainstream approaches to journalism can be seen as part of the gandhian tradition where the media is used to build bridges to promote conflict transformation and development so the basic precepts of these different perspectives of mass communication and journalism were inherent in gandhi's engagement with mass media so in fact uh, uh, ravish kumar we know the recipient of the raman magsese award for journalism 2019 uh, he draws on gandhi's engagement with the press and points out that gandhi's reflections on the media are very much relevant for today's divisive media so uh, there is an imperative need as uh, uh, my book also i kind of conclude that there is an imperative need to rediscover these principles of gandhian journalism in the contemporary profit oriented sensation seeking world of fake news paid news hate speech and so on through his writings and journals gandhi not only propagated his views but in the process he has provided certain lessons for journalists and media professionals as well as for readers and viewers to draw from so um, as i began the conversation uh, one of the biggest legacies that gandhi leaves us is with is that he provides us with numerous lessons to draw from and i think this is as true in the field of journalism as in many other spheres of life um I thank you so much for the patient listening and I'm happy to uh, take your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Madhu, are you going to conduct the proceeding? Um Gandhi ji always had a special way of connecting with people. He knew instinctively what a common man wanted and then likewise he used her mass media and journalism uh, you know not exactly to promote himself or to kind of get highlighted but he did that to actually pass on a message for to and and used it as a medium to say what he wanted and and to see that that it got accepted and that's a very it's a special uh, it's a special talent or you can say it's a gift that he had and uh, but he, he used it so responsibly that uh, he never misused or abused it at any point in time the the whole he had over masses he did not abuse it at all so this calls for questions any uh, questions that we want to ask so is there the chat uh, uh, i think ramesh has said that ma'am would you care to comment on the comparison between gandhi's use of press and uh, zelensky's use of social media today <laughs> Ma'am, you are muted. 
I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so what I was saying is that uh, we are jumping generations and decades, but uh, uh, thanks for the question. And in fact, that's the whole point of uh, uh, this. I mean, not the whole point of this. I mean, of course, I didn't foresee these things when I wrote the book or uh, this conversation came up, in fact. But uh, uh, when I see uh, the kind of media coverage that is going on right now uh, with the Russian Ukraine, Russia Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, I think uh, it's, the, it's entirely the opposite of what uh, Gandhi envisaged. In fact, uh, uh, the comparison between Gandhi's use of press and Zelensky's use of uh, social media today, uh, I think it's beyond uh, comparison, uh, comparison because, uh, I mean, obviously they are uh, entirely the opposite. Now, whether we are talking about Zelensky's use of the press or whether we are talking about uh, the, and we're talking about the international media is entirely polarized on this issue. And uh, at this point of time, I'd just like to go to, uh, I'd just like to give you a very brief background to actually uh, how I actually came to write this book. So uh, as, uh, 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 as when I was introduced, uh, uh, it was mentioned that I had my basic formal education in international relations, politics and international relations. So basically uh, from, from my MA, uh, uh, at one point of time, I was interested in becoming a journalist, actually. So, but uh, uh, I linked media and uh, studying the media and international relations. I studied on, on how the Indian media covered uh, Pakistan and how, uh, again, I went on to study how the Indian media covered Pakistan's nuclear program as vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, comparing with its, with, uh, in its own uh, program. I studied how the Indian press covers uh, human rights violations in Kashmir. I also studied about the international media coverage of uh, international conflicts, the war on terror and so on. And, uh, and the findings of all these works, these are different points. Of, and I also studied about how the question of gender is brought into uh, media coverage of uh, militarism and so on. So uh, in all these studies, uh, uh, my PhD, previous books, articles, in all these studies, they were rather uh, disheartening. Because uh, what I basically found was that this is exactly what we're seeing in the current context also. We see a decontextualizing of the conflict. Uh, we see a, a demonization of enemies, which is uh, what is happening now, whether it is Zelensky or whether it is Russia or whether, uh, the West. Whether, you know, <laughs> So uh, we see uh, demonization, uh, which is extremely relevant. Now. And even today, we see that uh, kind of orient, no, oriental no, no, notions of orientalism seem to uh, persist. We know that uh, the recently the, the debates over the BBC, BBC report, the, the CBS report, uh, the, uh, I forget, uh, one or two other newspapers also, the kind of uh, coverage that uh, it's one-sided and while overtly it is about the media uh, talking about uh, um, about it's it's uh, on the one hand while they're talking about peace actually what is happening is that they are being for war so that is what is happening and uh, uh, so what i would say is that uh, whether you look at it whether in the case of any conflicting uh, parties whether we're talking of uh, right now, since it's the international context which has been brought up, whether we're talking of India, Pakistan, whether we're talking of United States, Iraq, whether we're talking about, the, about Afghanistan, or whether we're talking about Russia and Zelensky, we ultimately see a kind of polarization in the media. Of course, I'm talking about the mainstream uh, uh, media. There are definitely very good exceptions, but the dominant mainstream media, uh, this is what uh, we are witness to. Uh, there's another question uh, by Mr. Venkatesh. He's asking what were Gandhiji's views expressed in press about the dichotomy of Indian businessmen fueling support, fueling supporting what was a socialist idealist, ideal driven, yeah, ideal driven freedom struggle. Sorry, it's quite a long question. Can you read that? Uh, just a second. Uh, what were his views expressed in press about the dichotomy of Indian businessmen fueling, fueling, supporting what was a socialist ideal-driven freedom struggle? 
uh, one uh, point I'd like to mention here is that uh, when I studied Gandhi's uh, engagements with the media, the focus has been particularly on questions of uh, conflict, conflict and social change. So uh, we are talking about, uh, uh, like, as I mentioned, 100 volumes of uh, Gandhi's writings. And uh, so I have not gone into uh, specific uh, details of each issue. Uh, it's more or less I've, I've gone into in the context of conflict. But one point I'd like to raise, I'd like to uh, address here is that when we talk about uh, Indian businessmen, uh, when in South Africa, uh, the Phoenix Settlement and Indian opinion uh, were going through a financial crisis, uh, we see that Gandhi uh, received 25,000 uh, rupees from uh, JRT Tata for, uh, to help with the Indian opinion and Phoenix Settlement. Uh, of course, on the one hand, uh, when we don't take advertisements, there is, uh, we can look at it critically. Even uh, Hydrogen, uh, as I mentioned, was uh, sponsored by Birla. And uh, we do see these controversies, which can be looked at uh, critically, uh, given the source of the, uh, source from where the finances have come from. Any other questions anyone wants to ask? You can unmute and ask. There is a question from uh, Professor Mala Pandurang. Could you comment on Gandhiji's firm stance on the use of vernacular languages as the most effective mode of mass communication? Yes, uh, Gandhi did uh, advocate the use of vernacular languages, uh, but then, uh, of course, we should remember that uh, Gandhi himself did use, uh, uh, in fact, when he, uh, at um, one point of time during the freedom struggle, he himself mentions that uh, he doesn't regret anything that he has lost, uh, that he has uh, 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 suffered in life or that he has uh, any lost opportunities in life, but uh, except for his love for English literature. So, uh, so there's always this controversy about uh, people generally tend to feel that uh, he was against English or something, but no, he, he was not uh, uh, against English uh, as such, but he did advocate the use of uh, vernacular languages and he did advocate uh, a common language for India at that point of time. It was in the context of bringing together the Hindu Muslim communities. He spoke about uh, Hindustani as a uh, 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 a common language for India, which was uh, 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 something which would be uh, uh, a linkage of Hindi and Urdu. I hope uh, that would answer your question. He speaks a lot on uh, use of vernacular languages in his writings. He's, he's uh, in uh, basic edu education particularly needs to be in the vernacular language. He gives a lot of importance definitely to vernacular languages, uh, but it is not, not that he was anti-English. And of course he did advocate a common language, which again is a major controversy, but then at that point of time, he felt uh, that was his position and uh, understandably given the communal uh, framework in which the country was. Anyone who wishes to ask questions can unmute themselves and directly ask. If say change the setting so you can do it directly. Anyone wants to ask? Basically, I think uh, this. Uh, my I just why comes some anyone comes to the question. This whole, uh, uh, I think the lessons of uh, that Gandhi, the Gandhian journalism, uh, I think we, need, we can draw a lot of lessons, even though the times have changed, we've moved on to the dig digital era and uh, the, the medium may have changed. The medium has definitely changed. In fact, if uh, 
like extremely hypothetically speaking, if Gandhi was alive today, he would have embraced the uh, internet and so on, given the amount of uh, communication that he was engaging with. Uh, but I think the media today could draw, definitely draw a lot of lessons from the way Gandhi used the media. Whether we are talking about the, uh, uh, particularly the, the visual media, the TV newsrooms, the kind of discussions and debates that we have, uh, which uh, even uh, not only the visual media, not only the uh, even the print media. So uh, particularly on how we need to engage with the other. Sorry, no. okay. yeah, so I think we can uh, draw a lot of lessons from Gandhi, even though we're talking about uh, um, a century ago, uh, even though the times have changed, even though we were in the digital era, uh, Gandhi's message still continues. In the digital era, Gandhi would have uh, made maximum use of all the social media, I, I believe maybe well, Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, Twitter, and uh, whatever it may be to convey his message. But at the same time, I think he would have uh, uh, had strongly worked for bridging the digital divide or for uh, the uh, information technology in the vernacular to develop information technology in the vernacular and uh, so on. Uh, any questions? Any more questions? Thank you, Dr. Teresa Joseph, for really uh, this riveting speech, which I think full of information, full of anecdotes, which we really enjoy. I think in general, we take uh, Gandhiji for granted because normal times we don't think of him. We think we have moved on. And then whenever we get into any uh, you know, crisis immediately, we just go back and check what Gandhiji has said. And then we feel, oh, it's still relevant. And then we try to kind of have a discussion. That way, he actually, whatever he said, I think transcends age and time. I'm really happy about that. And, and thank you for bringing out those uh, insights to us. And uh, uh, it's a very, as uh, Professor Mala Pandurang is saying in the chat, it is a very informative session with very interesting output. And thank you all for attending. And thank you, Madam, for being our guest speaker. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you so much.